presence. Uh, it is virtual, it is everyone in their home, but uh, you are present with us everywhere and uh, in all aspects. And uh, so that's why we come into your presence, seeking your continued uh, blessings, seeking your continued guidance, seeking your continued uh, uh, nourishment, that we be nourished with you, that we nourished by your words. Uh, I ask that you prepare all of us uh, to be uh, pots and vessels, to receive your uh, spiritual words, words of life, words that would fill us, words that would lift us up, uh, words that would help us be ready and prepared uh, in our walk with you and in our journey through the, 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 the Holy Week, uh, through the prayers of all the choir of heavenly hosts of angels, the intercessions of the Holy Theotokos and Mary and all the saints. Hear us as we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us their daily bread. Right. Thank you, Kareem, for uh, joining us. Uh, uh, you, you drove a long distance, Kareem, right? <laughs> Right. Really ap appreciate the time. <laughs> uh, thank you, Karim, and uh, uh, we're happy that you're uh, with us. So this is uh, this is our, our our basically last last talk uh, before the, the the Holy Week. So that's uh, hopefully something that we're gonna treasure uh, in our way towards the um, the Holy Week. So uh, please start us up in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Um. Let me know when y'all can see my screen. We can see it. Awesome. Cool. Okay. okay. Um, so, like Abuna mentioned, today um, was, I, I was, as Aki was speaking with me about coming to speak, um, he was telling me about, like, if you were to talk today, perhaps you can talk to us a little bit about Holy Week. So, I decided to do something a little different. It's Holy Week-esque, um, not necessarily entirely focused on Holy Week. So um, I want to kind of focus on a character of uh, in the plot line that's a bit of an antagonist in uh, or during Holy Week, and that's Judas. So we all heard the story. Um, give me one sec real quick. There we go. Sorry. Um, <laughs> So we all know who Judas is, right? So Judas is someone who um, was in Christ's inner circle. And I think we kind of take that for granted a little bit when we say in his inner circle, what does that really mean? So St. John actually describes that beautifully in his first epistle. He says this, he says, we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Even if you just hear his depiction, it's very, very personal and quite intimate about who Christ was to them and the fact that they were in their inner circle. These 12 men spent three years effectively living with our Lord when he was here. And what does that mean? So they actually saw all the countless different miracles that he performed and they had, like they were privy to hearing his wisdom firsthand. And one of those men decided to betray Christ unto death. Um, and that's Judas. And we all look at Judas and we say, Judas is such an evil person. How could Judas do what Judas did? How could he do that? Um, like, and not only could, how could you do that? I can betray Christ unto death. He saw the different signs that our Lord did firsthand. He saw him feed thousands of people. He saw them heal the blind, the lepers, the maimed. He saw him raise this, the daughter of Jairus, and he saw Lazarus himself being raised from the dead. And he still found it in himself to betray Christ unto death. And for what? For 30 pieces of silver. And we look at that and we say, Dude, how could you do that? How could like how could you be how could you be so fundamentally evil? How could you be so fundamentally broken 
to be able to betray Christ unto death like that. And for 30 pieces of silver. Am I so different than that myself? So let's kind of look at what I mean by that. Like Judas, I personally, in Christ's inner circle, if you want to talk about intimacy with Christ, I get to be adopted as Christ's son as Kareem. We are all Christ's adopted sons and daughters. He allows me to commune of his body and of his blood. Not only that, but then I get to be shown love that no greater love has ever been. I, I get to see a love that Judas didn't even necessarily see. And not only does he love me at such a macro level where he's willing to save me from death, but then he actually gets involved in the minutia, in the micro details of my life. And despite him giving me all these different things, I still betray Christ myself unto death. But I'm a little different. I don't do it um, with a kiss. I do it with my impure thoughts. I do it by swearing. I do it by judging people. I do it in drunkenness. I do it by lying. I do it by gossiping. People at work, people at church. But I betray Christ unto death myself all the time, almost every single day. Now, that's not really flattering. If I were to tell you you're like Judas, it doesn't come across as much of a compliment. It pains me to say that that is not the only similarity that we have with Judas. If you look at Judas, Judas, when um, an alabaster flask of oil was, um, a fragrant oil was broken to wash the feet of Christ, Judas said, how could you do this? Shouldn't you actually have sold that and given the money to the poor? You could have gotten 300 denarii for that and given that to the poor. And then this same man who says, why would you do that? Isn't that wrong, objectively wrong? Sell the money and give it to the poor? For 300 denarii, 300 denarii has value, is then able to come and for 30 pieces of silver, sell his Lord. Am I that different? Look at it this way. Oftentimes we might look at people and say, hey, why is that person doing that? Or did you hear what that family has going on in their home? Or do you know what they are actually willing to do on a Saturday night, all those guys before they come to liturgy and put their tonias on? And we start looking at them and saying, what are you guys doing? And we judge all these people for living lives a certain way. And then behind closed doors, behind closed doors or the privacy of our own minds. We have sinful thoughts like no one could imagine. I'd love to say that our similarity with Judas ends there, but it doesn't. I'm gonna take a quick break and back step and say this. The fact that I sin is not a surprise to God. God knows I'm going to sin. In fact, St. John says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, him being God, a liar, and his word is not in us. Meaning God knows I'm going to sin. And the beauty of that is he says, in the same passage, he says, if we confess our sins, St. John saying, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, Judas sinned. There's no doubt about that. Do you guys think Judas regretted his sin or not? Regretted us and didn't regret us and you guys can even just thumbs up on them. Thumbs up. Very good. Judas regret his sin. We regret our sin all the time. He was remorseful. 
But instead of turning back to God, instead of turning back to God, Judas fell into despair. And he hung himself. And friends, while I'm thankful that you and I are not committing physical suicide, I think we're doing the exact same thing spiritually ourselves. Because oftentimes we will sin. But how often are we actually coming back to God? We can say we're remorseful all we want. But how often does that actually translate into true repentance? And repentance means change. And it means like I will actually actively make a decision to say, I do not want to go back to that sin and do everything in my power to stay away from it. But oftentimes end up sitting with my sin indefinitely until I accept it for part of who I am. And I just become more and more complacent and it becomes normalized in the way I live my life. And the problem with this concept of normalization of deviance or this problem of um, it just becoming part of the fabric of my day-to-day -day life is I become desensitized to it and I accept it as part of something that I do. Or sometimes I might look at it to say, for example, this is a sin I struggle with, but it's not nearly as bad as the sin Aki struggles with. Therefore, because Aki struggles with that, so like this big, big sin, and I have this <laughs> sin, then not as big a deal. And I accept it as to say, I'm okay to have this as part of my life. And my friends, that is death. That is straight suicide. Um, this is something I like falling on a lot for anyone who knows me well. Um, it's from Hebrews chapter 10. Um, so St. Paul says this. He says, for if we willfully persist in sin. So pay attention to what he's saying here. So it's not if I willfully sinned. If it's I willfully persist in sin, meaning that I embrace it as part of who I am. And I'm okay with it. Like I'm saying, I know this is wrong and I'm going to continue it. And he says specifically after having received the knowledge of the truth. So it's not a question of I'm willfully persisting into not knowing what I'm doing. It's I know, like knowing full well what I'm doing. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Do you guys have any idea how big of a statement St. Paul is making here? He's saying, if I willfully persist in sin, after knowing what's right and wrong, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. St. Paul actually doesn't hold his punches back. He actually goes on to explain further. He says there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but then he says a fearful prospect of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. You might say, all right, St. Paul, chill. He says, I'm not done. He says, anyone who has violated the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by those who have spurned the Son of God, profaned the blood of the covenant by which they were sanctified and outraged? Uh, I wish they were, sorry, profaned the blood of the covenant by which they were sanctified is supposed to say a common thing and outraged the spirit of grace. For we know the one who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Look what St. Paul says at the end here. He says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If I willfully persist in sin and I'm not coming back to Christ, if I'm staying here. This is where I live. And what's crazy about this is St. Paul is saying this, which we so actively like 
hold on to. We, we're, we get so emotional when we see things like this. And people flock to the churches over Holy Week to try to spend as much time with God and to get close to God. And they feel as though this is such a like, pivotal part of their Christian life. If I willfully persist in sin, I'm effectively doing this. I'm saying, actually, I'm not saying St. Paul is telling us there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Christ is willing to do this if I want him. If I want to live a life with him, if I'm willing to come back, he does this to make it so that if I genuinely have a repentance, a metanoia, a change of mind that I want to come back to him. It's as easy as me going back to him to say, I'm sorry, I'm genuinely, genuinely sorry, and I do not want to do that again, and I will do everything in my power to prevent myself from doing that again. Come back. That's all he says is just come back. And if I willfully persist in sin, I'm effectively saying, no, thank you. I render this act of no greater love. I render this sacrifice of the blood of the lamb completely null and void. And the reason why sometimes, again, I don't think I necessarily have a problem is because I might think that I have my head in the sand or again, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes I bury my head or sometimes I'm comparing myself to other people to feel as though perhaps I'm not as bad as they are. Therefore, I'm good. Since when is a relative measure of my relationship with Christ sufficient? Because, like, I'm going to just pick on Aki, but, like, if Aki's doing one thing and I'm not doing it, does that mean I'm therefore good? Think about it from a health perspective. If one person is quite unhealthy and I'm, not, I'm less unhealthy, does that therefore make me healthy? And as we're speaking about this, logically speaking, everyone's kind of like, yeah, of course. Like, what are you saying? But then do we actually internalize that? Do we actually look at our lives to say, no, I'm, no I have a problem. I have a problem. Like, I have an acute problem or a chronic problem, rather. Like, I, I'm, I'm a proper sinner and I'm far from God. And not that I'm sinning in the sin in, itself, in and of itself is the problem. Because if we mentioned earlier, God knows we're going to sin. That's not the problem. The problem isn't that we've sinned. The problem is that we're not coming back. And, and our, like, not coming back, and, and sorry, it's not just that we, like, the problem isn't just that we sin, and it's not that we're not feeling bad, because we do feel bad. But then what? What are we doing with that? Like, respectfully, if you feel bad that you've sinned, and it ends there, who cares? Who cares? What are you doing with that? I feel bad. And unless it results in me coming back to God, this is where I end up. We look at Judas and we say, this guy's a fool. This guy's evil. And a man's a fool. And we ought to look in the mirror because we saw his example. And we do the exact same thing. This is really, really important. This concept of what do I do? What do I do is critical. Just because I want or I say that I want to go back to God or I want to repent, that's insufficient. St. Gregory says this, he says, a disposition or just a desire or like a position to say like, this is what I believe. He says a disposition is an unsatisfactory thing unless we give it practical effect. Deeds show dispositions. This is St. Gregory pretty much saying, put your money where your mouth is. Right? You actually want to come back to God? then come back to God. But there are things that prevent us from coming back to God. 
And it's such an interesting thing because if you look at this, we look at this to say, this was done to allow me an easy path back to God. If this was done to allow me an easy path back to God, what actually holds me back? It's a bunch of different reasons why. So shame, I think, is one of them. And I think that sometimes we look at shame to say, like, the reason why, like, how can I go back to God after what I've done? Anyone see a problem with that? What do you guys, like, I can actually, I can keep talking, but do people, tip, like, do you guys typically engage or how does it work? Yeah, we can definitely engage. Yeah, like, so let's talk about this a little bit. Like, what do you guys think? Like, what actually prevents us? Let's talk about shame. How did, why does shame hold us back? Or do you guys think shame ever holds us back? It's funny, as soon as you put up that slide, shame wasn't the first thing that came to mind. For me, per Maybe it's the shame that you keep going back to the sin. Okay. Okay. I'd say like it's the embarrassment. Like you're so embarrassed. Like I know some people who are embarrassed to confess the sin to begin with. Mm -hmm. But like, and they're just afraid of like an abuna or like their father of confession, who's like mm -hmm. another human being, yeah. and more than like anyone else. Yeah. So shame or embarrassment? Yeah, abuna, you unmuted yourself. You want to say something? Yeah, I think shame is a kind of an ancient uh, 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 aspect uh, since since the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve. So the, the, the reason they did not want to meet with God was shame. The reason they hid from God was was shame. So it is it is a strong, of course, a, a reason that makes us feel we don't want to really we feel bad about ourselves and we uh, uh, feel ashamed of what we did and think we're never going to be accepted. So I would be lying to you if I told you that shame wasn't something that I struggled with. But I got to be honest, despite the fact that shame is something I can admittedly say I struggle with, it's kind of embarrassing that I struggle with shame. I'll tell you why. Do, you, like, do we sometimes realize that shame is the most illogical thing to feel as a, like something to prevent us to go back to God? Like, has anyone ever seen, this is going to sound awful. This is a really bad analogy and I'm sorry that I'm even bringing, making this. Has anyone seen the meme of like the, dent, the dentist asking you like, yo, when was the last time you flossed? And it's like, yo dog, you were there. Has anyone seen that before? Yeah. Yes, no? Yeah. Well, it was just me. Thanks. Adam. No, no, I saw it. I saw it. What if, what's up, Thomas? Thanks, man. Um, <laughs> it's the same idea. Like if we were to say like, I'm afraid to confess my sin to God, like I, I'm so ashamed of doing that. He witnessed your sin. He witnessed it. He, he knew you were going to do it. He was there when you did it. But bigger than that, and I think this is what we miss, is he knew you were going to do it. He was there when you did it. And it was with foreknowledge of what you were going to do that he still looked at, well, make it about me. He knew I was going to sin. He saw me sin, witnessed me sin. And with the foreknowledge that Kareem was going to sin, still said, Kareem is worth the blood of my son, and I will die for Kareem. So that if Kareem comes back to say, I want life eternal, it is his, by birthright as adoption as my son. The obstacle to me having that birthright of life by adoption, it becomes whom? Who's the obstacle? Me. Like, as I'm saying this, and, and like, again, not to belittle anyone because I deal with shame myself, but do you not hear how illogical I sound? Like, he's... Oh, he knew he was there and said, despite that, I'm going to die so that he can come back. And if I say no, I'm not going to go back because I'm ashamed. All of Holy Week coming up, 
becomes completely useless. What's the point? What's the point? If all of Holy Week leading up to my Lord's crucifixion so that I can have what is his does not allow me to come back to him because I'm refusing to come back to him, I've rendered it null and void. There's um, St. John Chrysostom writes this um, passage about also how shame makes no sense. Um, sorry, not that it makes no sense, that it shouldn't prevent us um, from coming back to God, but it's quite long. Um, so perhaps what I'll do, Aki, I'll send it to you, maybe you can fire it over to the group, or I can also toss it in the chat sure. um, if someone wants to catch it later. Um, I also realize it's not accessible as I'm sharing my screen, so I'll do that afterwards, but it's, uh, it's quite nice. Um, sorry, just bear with me here. Now, pride is another one that I like, because I don't think pride is one that we speak about. Sometimes we feel bad about, um, and, and perhaps this is not what prevents us from coming back to God, but perhaps I think this is sometimes we confuse why we feel bad. Let me explain what I mean. Sometimes when we sin, we feel as though um, we've disappointed ourselves. Do you guys get what I mean by that or not? So instead of it being, I've sinned, how can I do that to my God? It becomes, uh, I've sinned, how can Kareem stoop so low? Or how can, Kareem's better than that. Kareem, all, like other people, other people do that. Kareem, Kareem doesn't do that. Does that resonate with anyone? Like, I, I feel like sometimes it's not truly because we're remorseful or penitent. It's because we've disappointed ourselves. And if we've disappointed ourselves, then the next step for us is clearly not reconciliation with God because God is not the one with whom we feel we need to be reconciled. It's almost like we need to reconcile with ourselves. We don't feel like as if we've offended God. We feel like we've offended ourselves. We missed the bigger picture. Right? In fact, we're actually digging ourselves a deeper hole of sin. If I, I'm almost worshiping myself, holding myself to a bigger standard. Um, the last two, I think, and again, this is certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, I think denial is one of them. I, I think we don't want to accept that we've done something because, and, and this kind of ties into shame as well to a certain extent. Um, but... Um, yeah, like we, we don't want to admit that we've done something like this. Um, or that we don't want to admit that we have a problem. It's kind of having someone's head buried in the sand. The last one is super sad. And this is kind of the one that St. Paul addresses when he says willful persistence in sin. Is when he talks about an unwillingness to change. Sometimes the reason I don't want to go back to God is because I'm actually happy with where I am as broken as that may be. Um, I like the darkness. I, 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 we're not stupid people. We sin because we get something out of it. And sometimes the, the ROI is worth it. So sometimes that's actually preventing us from going back to God. But what I'm trying to share with you guys here is all these different things. Like, again, he did this so that I can come back to him with ease. What am I allowing to prevent me from accessing this? Respectfully, if you personally hold next week is important, I don't think you have the right to do so if you are not actively trying to come back to him. I know that sounds provocative, and I know that's not nice to say. But I'm also in the business of being a straight shooter, so forgive me. But if we don't want back in, why do we even consider next week's special? He's done all this for me to come back to him with ease. Kareem, I you remain... 
Pardon? Sorry, I was gonna, I was gonna ask or just pull a point of pose a question. Um, can you argue that some people use next week as their in to change? If they whether they change it. after that following week or not, that's a whole different story. But people will say, you know what, Sunday we're starting fresh. I'm gonna give it my all, and then TBD to be continued. Right. So I think it was, and I don't remember who the exchange was with, but I think it's from the Desert Fathers. I think it's Saint like Abba Silvanus and Abba Moses, and he was asking him, like, can a man lay a new foundation every day? And he was responded to by saying, a man can lay a new foundation every moment. Meaning, like, you can always come back to God. And you don't need to say, like, well, I, I've lived my life in darkness, right? Or can I start tomorrow again? He said, you can start now. You don't have to wait until tomorrow. So to answer your question, absolutely, you can say, yeah, next week can be the beginning of something. But it needs to be the beginning of something. It needs to be changed. Because if it's just artificial for me to give myself a placebo to say, next week is just going to be like a high, but then I don't have a desire to come back or there's no true met like repentance means change. Like literally translated means metanoia or a metanus, which is a change of mind. And if not, if I've not had that change of mind, then this, like, and I'm willfully persisting in sin. And guys, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be explicitly clear here. What St. Paul is talking about is willfully choosing a life of sin. Willfully persisting in a life of sin. When I willfully persist in a life of sin, she says the, they're no longer remain in sacrifice for sins. I'm effectively rejecting a desire to be with God in the first place. So, Aki, to answer your question, if I'm rejecting a desire to live a life with Christ, next week remains useless altogether. But if I choose to say next week will be like the catalyst for me to reignite my relationship with Christ, by all means, by all means. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, for sure. Um, and then you were, you were just mentioning the, you were mentioning the, the, you know, the notion or the idea of and repentance. And maybe this is, maybe this is the, the quote that you were referring to about St. John Chrysostom when he goes, sin is the wound, repentance is the, is the medicine. Sin is followed by shame. Repentance is followed by boldness. Satan, however, has overturned this order and given boldness to sin and shame to repentance. Um, so, and it goes back to a couple of slides where you're saying about shame or embarrassment or whatever, you know, whatever you want to categorize it. Um, but I think we also live in this world now where it's like, you know what, I'm just, I'm going to be to myself. I'm okay. I'll do me don't need to talk to anyone. It's between me and myself. I don't need to involve, you know, a priest or so on. And, and truthfully, like, I know individuals now who, you know, because of this lockdown, it's like, well, why am I going to confess on the, on the phone when I can just, you know, confess in prayer? So you've got all these external factors now that are playing in that are making it a lot harder. Yeah, fair. And, and I think it begs the question of what's actually holding me back. And, and I, I'm going to actually circle back to that. Like, if I have something that's holding me back, I think it's important to explore it and to be incredibly introspective with myself. Um, like, if I say, like, I can just confess to God, I don't need to involve a Buddha. Okay, fine. If that's the position you want to take, take it. But why? I find it useless. Okay, why? And what's your aversion to it? Like, I think it's important to actually dig into that. Um, to identify the root cause of why something is preventing, like what's actually preventing you. Um, and I, I think there's something very beautiful about the idea of confession. And I think that from an accountability perspective, it's actually great as well. Um, I'll share something with you guys. Um, hey, Aki, how many people are we broadcasting to? Uh, as of right now, it's saying 10, 11, 12. Okay. Relatively safe. All right. Um, and then 15 on Zoom. So we're looking at yeah, yeah, we're, we're good. We're good. Right there. Yeah. But um, then people go back and watch it anytime. So whatever you say, just be cautious of. It's recorded, Ooh. just so you know. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Very good. Excellent. Okay. So, it's, a, it's forever on the internet. Pardon? It's forever on the internet. I love it. Yeah. Um, 
but by all means, go ahead and confess your sins. Yeah, 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 I'm about to. Very good, thanks. Um, so one thing I remember vividly, um, I was talking to my confession father about some, and I was confessing one particular sin, um, and he looked at me. <laughs> he, he actually, he interrupted me. And it was a bit of an aggressive head nod at me. He's like, he's sitting back. And <laughs> he's sitting back. And I was talking. And he interrupted me. He's like, do you know why you do that? And I'm like, what? He's like, do you know why you do that? And I was like, no. And I was speaking. But OK, go ahead. He's like, because you're proud. I'm like, what? And he's like, because you're proud. And I was like, okay, say more. So he explained it to me. And I was hard pressed to be able to actually find a response to him. He was right on money. Why I'm sharing that with you guys is because I came in thinking that one thing was a problem. And while it was a problem, there was an un like a bigger underlying problem, um, which was pride. And my pride prevented me from actually being able to see that as a problem. And he saw right through it. And the man is no nonsense. He called me out just like that. Um, and I actually found that to be a very beautiful thing. So actually back to your point of like this, like when we're talking about um, different things that might be preventing me from actually doing this. Um, I think that, again, what's my goal? And if my goal is true, proper reconciliation with my God who gave his blood so that I can live, am I not willing to put up with a tinge of discomfort in having a conversation with my father of confession who I call my father of confession, not some bloke in a black robe, I call him my father of confession. We call him Abuna, our father, who is meant to guide me on my path of Christ. Am I unwilling to even expose myself to a touch of discomfort so that I can get, like, so um, is that what I'm willing to, am I willing to, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. it's been there. Am I struggling to reconcile with the one who gave his life so that I can live because I don't want to look silly or I don't want to be embarrassed. How badly do I want this reconciliation? And I think that's one question we really have to ask ourselves. What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to sacrifice to have Christ? And the flip side to that is this coming week, he's about to show you what he was willing to sacrifice and is still willing to sacrifice so that he can have you. How do we say anything to the, like, to the contrary? How can we say anything to the contrary? How can we say, like, he's made it, like, this slide is so fitting right now. He's done all this so you can come back with ease. And the different things that are hard, we're calling, sorry, the different things that are easy, compared to this, we're calling heart. And truthfully, if this is something that you are struggling with, ask God to help you with this. Like, I don't know how often we actually do that. To ask God to strengthen us, to give us like the resolve to be able to stand in front of my confession, Father, and confess that for which I've already repented in my room. I've repented in my room. I've made the decision that this is no longer something I want to do. And then I confess with my father. I don't think it was a question. I think you were making more of a point. So I was going to say, does that answer your question? But I don't think you were asking me a question necessarily. But yeah. Was it also, I kind of like the fact that you have to kind of lean over and unmute yourself. So anytime I can <laughs> come and kind of inconvenience you, I'm going to take it. So you can fully see it. Yeah, no, you're we're good. We're good. It wasn't really a question, it was more of a comment, but uh yeah, glad you elaborate on it. Thank you. The um the quote 
is a little more involved. Um, it's it's something to that effect, but I'll um, I'll find it so I don't botch it. It's our job to not say I cannot be saved or I cannot come back to God. When I do sin, and not if, it's not if. Saint Paul says all men um, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Saint John says that if we say we have no sin, we call him a liar. He did, again, he did this because he knows we're going to sin. So when I sin, don't condemn yourself to this. But come back to this. I love this saying so much, which is repentance transforms adulterers into virgins. It's by St. John Saber. But that is the promise that next week gives us that Literally, so not only can repentance transform adulterers into virgins, he raises the dead. He gives us life by his death. Super easy, super, super easy for us to look at this and say, this is objectively like the archetype of what one ought not to do. And we do the exact same stuff all the time. My challenge to you guys is to do this instead, is to come back and don't sentence yourself to this, but embrace your father the same way he is willing to come and embrace you. That's all I got for you guys. I'm 10 minutes over, I'll keep my bed. We're good, man, no one's going anywhere. <laughs> Um, I'm open to challenges. I'm open to questions, comments. Like when Aki challenged me, that was my that's my jam. I, I like being challenged, so by all means. This is your opportunity, folks, to ask Kareem the hard questions. I kind of have a question slash a comment. Um, if you go back to the slide of like the four different reasons why like we don't go back to God, I think one of them may not be like may not fall under one of those categories but sometimes you're so afraid of the consequences of the the sin that you've already committed like the one thing i can think of of like the top of my head right now like for example someone who was an alcoholic and um now they have like liver disease and they're suffering from that and they're like you know what if if i recover from this and um like try to repent from that sin I have to live with the consequences that my sin inflicted on my life right now. So I'd rather live in like that despair and the life of sin and just like forget about my, my other problems by continuing to drink. Um, and that's why like I'm comfortable with the way that I'm living my life. It's, it's kind of like that unwillingness, but it's more of unwillingness combined with fear of living with the consequences. Yeah, I completely understand what you're saying. Give me one sec. I'm not going to answer this myself. I'm actually going to go to, I think it's Chrysostom, but I don't want to make that up. Give me one sec. I'm actually going to find it. Um, but in the meantime, you're going to have to be patient. My bad. No worries. Take your um, Sorry. Bum, 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 bum. Sorry, guys. I wasn't expecting to have to look this up. Um, and actually, actually, I have a really good idea. Aki? Yes, sir. I'm going to send this to you on WhatsApp because it's actually too large of a quote to send in the chat. <laughs> but I'm going to send that to you as I'm looking for this. Do you mind just reading this to the folks? Have it. Cheers, buddy. Um, bum, 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 bum. You wretched man, when you were entangled with the prostitute, you were unashamed. And when you come to repent, then you are ashamed. Tell me, 
Does he feel ashamed? Why was it when he committed the prostitution, he was not ashamed? He commits the act that is unashamed, but in order to say what he did, he blushes. But this is the devil's wickedness. He does not allow the human being to feel ashamed while publicly committing the sin because he knows that if he were to feel shame, he would avoid sin. The devil makes the devil makes feel sorry, the devil makes him feel ashamed because of repentance, because he knows that the human being will not repent out of his shame. The devil commits two evils. He draws towards sin and he hinders repentance. Why then do you feel ashamed? When you were committing prostitution, where you were unashamed, and you are ashamed when you apply the medicine, you are ashamed when you deliver yourself from sin, then you profit from being ashamed. When you were sinning, you should have felt the disgrace. When you were becoming a sinner, you were not ashamed, but when you become just, you feel ashamed. Thanks. Uh, I'm posting is it Marina. Yeah. Um, so I was lying. It's not St. John Chrysostom, but St. John Climacus or St. John of the Ladder. He says a fresh warm wound is easier to heal than those that are old, neglected, and festering, and that need extensive treatment, surgery, bandaging, and cauterization. He says long neglect can render many of them incurable. However, all things are possible with God. Um, so kind of to touch your point, like if I just continue putting that off, putting that off, putting that off, I'm not, and again, like th these are not things that we don't know. We know them, like we're intelligent people, we get it, but when it becomes personal, when it becomes about me, it becomes a lot harder to actually apply that. Um, but it's dangerous, right? It gets worse. It doesn't get, it doesn't remain status quo. Um, it gets worse. So, yeah. Other questions, other challenges, other comments altogether? I'm all ears. Um, someone told me, um, like their confession father said, like confession is not necessarily about cadence but it's about like the genuineness or the quality of the confession. And I think that speaks to something like if we're going through the motion as opposed to having a true metanoia, again, what's the point? Um, but it, it's not necessarily about like cadence or it, it's, it's honestly about like the quality of my repentance and the commitment I have in that repentance. So. That's a good point, Kareem, because I know like growing up, you always, you always heard from you know the parents or from the priests you know, make sure you, you make sure you're, you're confessing every month, make sure you're confessing every two months, whatever it is. Um, but if it becomes just a habitual thing where you're just regurgitating the same sins over and over and there's no actual um, true repentance that's coming from it, then you're wasting your time and the priest's time. I'm going to correct me if I'm wrong. And you're, and you might be fooling yourself. That's the other problem too, is you might be fooling yourself into thinking that you're doing something, Right. I remember actually I had this conversation with my confession father too. And I told him like, Hey, I'm there. Sometimes I leave your office and I don't feel any better. or I don't feel any, like, I don't feel um, relieved. And he asked me the question, like, did you feel burdened in the first place? Um, it's a fair question. The answer is no, I didn't feel burdened. I was like going through the list of different things I wanted to talk about. I'm like, I should probably talk about this, but did I feel bad about it? No. Again, I was um, I, that sin is being committed because I get something out of it and I like what I get out of it. Therefore I do it. Did I feel bad? No, I didn't. That's why I didn't feel relieved walking out. So what's the point of confession at that stage? Right? So again, I'm confessing to my confession father that which I repented for, um, or I'm, I'm repenting from in my room. Like, I have to have that repentance first. And then as a result of that introspection, then come to Abuna and have that conversation. And if I'm struggling, Abuna can help me with that introspection 100%. Um, but it's important for me to actually have that personal repentance as well. I, I feel this is uh, taking uh, taking us back to the picture that is behind you, Karim. <laughs> uh, because this is th this is exactly the experience uh, of, of, of the prodigal son returning back to his father 
uh, we are still in the physical realm. So to experience being embraced by the Father, to feel the acceptance by the Father, uh, uh, despite of all the filth that maybe uh, sin or has caused uh, to accumulate on me, or the wounds or the bad smell that maybe is coming out of me. So to experience this acceptance from my father of confession, this is by itself is feeling God's acceptance, uh, God's embrace, God's uh, uh, accepting me despite of everything. And this is by itself uh, uh, is a healing, is, is a healing experience. Anyone else with comments or questions to Kareem and Orabuna? Orabuna, yeah. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> like the guy's here. He's here to field questions too. <laughs> Hi. Um, it's Fadi here, guys. Hi. How are you guys doing? Um, I have a question for Abuna um, regarding what you were saying, Kareem. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Abuna, so um, I just wanted to know, um, um, is it right that I wouldn't uh, confess about a sin that deep down inside, I do not believe that I really repented from? So when, when I come to confession, um, I'm coming with all intentions that I'm not doing this sin again? Yes, uh, uh, which, which, which is what was mentioned by Kareem, that I repent in my room. Uh, between me and God, and then I come for the confession. However, sometimes we need to expose because just by the virtue of not wanting to let go, this deserves confession. This mm -hmm. deserves at least a conversation. So sometimes I think, you know what, I'm just keeping this to myself. Uh, and the more that I keep it, I'm basically not revealing it. It's like going to the physician and not being, not, not wanting to be healed. So I know that I have sickness, uh, but I don't, I don't want it to be healed. The problem is that, and I think this is one of the, one of the, one of the quotes, one of the saying that was mentioned by uh, Saint John Chrysostom, that the more that it lasts, uh, 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 yeah, but, but by John Clemakers, the, the more that it stays, the more that it's causing problem, the more that it's ca that, that, that is causing really issues in me and it becomes more difficult. So just saying, you know what, I have this issue, but you know what, I, I have no intention or I, I struggle to really bring it up because I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to leave it. And maybe just by having this conversation, this is exposing the thought by itself. Nice. I like that. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. If I may actually add something to that real quick. Yes, please. Is like, I also think that even in having that conversation, Abuna might say like, okay, that's good. Like you've exposed it and like, we can talk about that, but maybe even bigger than that is why is it that you feel as though you don't want it? Like forget the actual sin that you're talking about. Let's talk about the motivator behind why you don't want to confess that in the first place. Or why do you feel like there are certain things that you don't want to expose? I think that in and of itself warrants a conversation beyond the one sin or the several sins that you might want to keep um, closer to the chest or that you don't want to repent from, the fact that you know about it and you don't want to expose it or you don't want to repent from it, I think in and of itself warrants a conversation. Um, and the beautiful thing about confession is that confession is not strictly like, here's a laundry list of the different things that I've done. I get absolution and I walk away. But I get a father who's able to help put my hand in the hand of Christ to help guide me on my path to my savior and spending eternity with him. So if there's something that's sitting on my chest that I don't want to expose or something that I've not repented from that I don't want to repent from, I think it can be indicative of a problem in my spiritual life that my confession father can help expose me to in the first place and then help navigate, help me navigate. Um, so it, it, it extends beyond the actual sin as well. Um, it can go deeper. So I, I think that there's very little, if nothing, um, to lose and everything to gain. And again, the one thing that we could fear of, um, we could fear in the interaction is this concept of shame yet again. Um, but again, when we're talking about what am I willing to sacrifice, 
am I willing to sacrifice my ego or my pride or my prestige to a certain extent or my image in front of a Buddha um, at the cost of a relationship with the one who sacrificed everything to win me. Other questions, other comments, challenges, anecdotes? I kind of have a question regarding um, the sins that we commit unknowingly. So like if you're unaware of a sin that you're committing or like you're blind by it, like you're blind from seeing it. Um, similar to like the example that you were giving earlier about how it's it was pride, like your father of confession was able to pinpoint that, um, but you you couldn't see that yourself. So how can you confess or how can you fix a problem when you don't know the root cause? I think asking to find out the root cause is important as well. So that comes in two different ways, I think. And I'll let it win up fine as well, but um, I'd say number one is in having conversations transparently with your confession father, your confession father can help hold, hold you accountable. But I would say before that even, I would say in my prayer life, I think it's important for me to be asking God to expose that to me. Um, St. Peter, um, I think in Acts chapter one or Acts chapter two, um, he says something beautiful. Um, and it, this is just them trying to replace Judas. But in his, so they, they draw lots. Um, and before they did that, they prayed. And St. Peter said something that I think a lot of us kind of skate over real quick. He says, oh, you who knows the hearts of all. And then he talks, like, help us effectively choose a replacement for um, Judas, who, like, like for Judas. But his prayer is, oh, you who knows the hearts of all. Meaning that he knows my heart. He knows everything about me. So if I turn to him to say, Help me see what I'm not seeing. You know when someone says like, hey, do I have anything in my teeth? Um, you got to be willing to ask that question. And I think that otherwise you'll never know, right? Well, you might, feel, if it, depending on how big it is. But otherwise you'll never know. And I think it's important to ask that question um, and to desire to know. I think sometimes, again, kind of what we had earlier, like with someone's head in the sand, Sometimes we don't want to know. Sometimes we kind of want to accept like, oh, I don't have sins. Or like, no, nah, I'm okay. And a lot of that, sometimes that comes from comparing ourselves to other people who might be sinning a lot more overtly or might be sinning on what I'll call more traditional sins or more visible sins. Um, and we compare ourselves to them and say, I'm not doing that, therefore I don't have a struggle or therefore I don't have a sin. But how well are you looking? Um, how badly do you want to find the differences? And I think that once you've like, so I, I think it comes from as much introspection as possible and then asking God to help you um, find that which you cannot see. And then also exposing yourself, whether that be to your confession, Father, whether that be like, I have a friend of mine who looks at me straight in the face and be like, yo, dude, this is what you're struggling with. This is what you suck with straight up. And I love having a relationship with someone like that because he holds me accountable. He makes me better. Um, and if you're protected in that relationship of love, where it's not a question of like, you suck um, and I'm better than you. It's a, I love you. And this is why I'm telling you this. Um, it's a very beautiful thing. Um, but you got to be willing to take it. That's the other thing. That's like, I don't know if Abun is a different thing. He unmuted himself, please, but to save me. But that's, those are my two cents. No, 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 I, I definitely uh, uh, agree with everything you said, Karim. Uh, uh, added to this, uh, maybe a couple of points also, uh, is, is uh, uh, readiness to change based on what will I know. So some, uh, uh, I believe that God, out of his own mercy, does not reveal and expose all my weaknesses to me in one shot. So he gives me one bit and then the question, what are you going to do with this? So the more that I'm responsive with what he reveals to me, then he's going to reveal the next step. So, so it, it's, not, it's not a matter of, 
I need to have a list of 500 items that I'm going to be working on. Uh, I believe God, in, in my understanding, it's, it's a journey and it's a process. And as I grow spiritually, God expo helped me to reveal things to me. And this is discussed. So the way God reveals, one of the aspect is the father of confession. One is the aspect is my prayer room, one of the aspects, my spiritual discipline. So all of these, all of my fasting, my prayers, my coming to church, meetings, my reflection. So all of these are uh, uh, venues through which God would reveal to me, but bit by bit. And the question is, what will I do with it? Uh, will I respond to it in a way that would help me grow? or I feel that I'm not ready to grow, that I'm not gonna be moving forward. One of the wonderful examples that I like is uh, King David. King David is an amazing person that he made a lot of sins, but the minute God reveals to him, this is wrong about you, he would respond in a humble way, who am I Lord? And he have mercy on your servant, he's the king. He would humble himself and we, he would go to God and would, uh, would accept his uh, 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 correction. Uh, so, so it becomes a process. So uh, it's not about how much is revealed, what I do with it. And what is more important is until the last day of our life, we're going to continue to have problems and sin. <laughs> but it's not about just the sin. It's about my fellowship with Christ. The most important thing is to uh, be with Christ. Sometimes I am in the house, but I'm not really in the house. I'm not really with Christ. It's like the older son in the in the in the parable of the prodigal son, right? So I am I'm in the house, but I am not really enjoying my father's wealth, and that's what made uh, the older son come and say, uh, 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 "Your son of yours has done all of this," and when he comes back you would celebrate for him. But I have been living with you and you did not give me anything. So the father says, everything that I have is yours. You, you just need to take, enjoy what is yours. But he was living in the house, but as a slave, not as a son. So another aspect, which is living with Christ, growing with Christ. And the more that I grow with Christ, I think uh, I always say this, uh, you, had, uh, you, you kill two birds with one stone. You grow and automatically a lot of negative aspects is, 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 is kind of loosened automatically. That's a good question. Other takers? I think that might be it. Thank you, Kareem. Thank you, Kareem. I think this was uh, uh, amazing uh, presentation, uh, discussion. Uh, so presentation intrigued the nice discussion to really help us uh, uh, go into the uh, uh, Holy Week and walk with Christ. And yes, to realize we're not much better than uh, Judas. Uh, uh, we do the same thing a lot of the times, probably every day. <laughs> Uh, hopefully we're, 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 we're more like Peter, not Judas. <laughs> uh, so I think this is a good foundation for us. It's a good uh, segue for us uh, going into the uh, uh, Holy Week with this, with this attitude, with really seeing uh, 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 the love of our Lord Jesus Christ and clinging to his love and being reminded that no matter how uh, uh, many or ugly or repeated uh, sin, that's, that's, that's okay. There is a lot and abundant love that is for me that is manifested on the wood of the cross. So again, thank you very much, Karim. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I think Marina, Marina has a, a small game for us to, uh, to engage. <laughs> I do. Um, I don't know how many 